Hello, and welcome to the Parkinson's Disease and Special Senses program, Vision, Smell, and Taste, a collaboration between the Parkinson's Foundation and the Movement Disorder Center at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center. I'm Melody McLaughlin, Senior Community Program Manager for the New England Chapter of the Parkinson's Foundation, and I'm so thrilled to be joining you today for this very special program. For those of you who are newer to the Parkinson's Foundation, welcome. We are the nation's leading community for people with Parkinson's disease, the people who love them, and all of those who are working to end the disease. It's with our presence in communities across the country and the globe, we believe in the promise of a cure and a better life today for those impacted by PD. The urgency of our mission really translates into what we do. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals. One, ensuring better care for everyone for today. Two, understanding Parkinson's through research for tomorrow. And three, educating and empowering the Parkinson's community for us all. We provide free resources, including our parkinson.org website, educational book series, webinars, podcasts, our hospital safety kit called Aware and Care, our newly diagnosed kit, and of course our toll-free helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO, which is staffed by Parkinson's specialists. On the research front, we invest more than $10 million annually to study Parkinson's, what causes it, how to treat it, and ultimately how to cure it. I'd like to highlight PD Generation, which is an initiative that offers genetic testing and genetic counseling at no cost for people with Parkinson's. After a successful pilot program, we are thrilled to announce that PD Gene has launched its next step, a genetic test that can be completed at home. To learn more, visit parkinson.org slash PD Generation. So how are we connecting with our communities? Your being here with us today is a prime example of that. It's really through our centers of excellence, our local PD experts, including those at St. Elizabeth's chapters like ours in New England, volunteers, advocates, and staff across the country that we bring people together to educate and empower those impacted by Parkinson's. We also connect with our Parkinson's communities through our nationwide Moving Day events. Since 2011, our Moving Day walks have raised more than $27 million to support research, our centers of excellence networks, and provide education resources and programs across the country. We're very excited to share that we'll be bringing a moving day to New Hampshire in the spring of 2021. So please stay tuned for that. To learn more about moving days, please visit movingdaywalk.org or to see our recent virtual moving day in Boston, visit movingdayboston.org. And always looking for ways to keep the PD community connected, the Parkinson's Foundation has been providing weekly educational and wellness programs in a virtual format through our PD Health at Home series. PD Health at Home is presented by the Light of Day Foundation, whose generosity has made this programming possible so that you can join us for Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, or Fitness Fridays by visiting parkinson.org slash pdhealth. Today's program was made possible by the support of our sponsors. Today, we thank our platinum sponsor, Synovian, and our bronze sponsors, Acadia, Kiowa Kieran, and Medtronic. We invite you to learn about our program sponsors by visiting our virtual exhibit hall at parkinson.org slash New England slash chapter supporters. And before we kick off today's program, let's hear a few words from our platinum sponsor, Synovian. People with Parkinson's need new ideas, little ideas, big ideas, ideas that may even change lives. And that's why we created Little Big Things, an innovation platform for people with Parkinson's, care partners, doctors, innovators, and more. Join us, and together, let's spark, share, and celebrate the little big things happening in Parkinson's disease. Great, thank you, Synovian. And now I'd like to introduce Keith Ciccone of St. Elizabeth's Movement Disorder Center. Keith is a movement disorder nurse specialist working in providing nursing care, assessment, telephone triage, coordinating community resources and services, and facilitating the deep brain stimulation programming. 
Keith has almost two decades of experience working with patients and families with Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, movement disorders, epilepsy, and cognitive impairment. Keith received his BS in music therapy with a minor in psychology from Anna Maria College in Paxton, Massachusetts, and received his nursing diploma from Chelsea Soldier Home School of Nursing. I warmly welcome Keith to start us off by sharing more about St. Elizabeth's Neurology Department. Good day, everyone. I want to take this moment to introduce myself and our Movement Disorder Center. My name is Keith Ciccone, Movement Disorder Nurse Specialist. I bring over 26 years of nursing expertise to St. Elizabeth's Medical Center with the past 20 years working with the Parkinson's disease community. St. Elizabeth's Medical Center Neurology Department is located in Brighton, Massachusetts and offers patients with a comprehensive nationally recognized approach to the treatment of neurological conditions. Patients with a suspected movement disorder receive a detailed clinical evaluation, laboratory testing and imaging as appropriate. If applicable, a comprehensive program of medications and therapies are initiated. Patients are also provided with educational resources, programming, and have access to novel treatments. Support group resources are given for their patients as well as their families. Patients who are interested in surgical interventions for their Parkinson's disease are able to receive deep brain stimulation in or duopa. Our movement is sort of specialist Dr. Anna Huller and Dr. Okianis Vau, along with our movement disorder nurses, Afi Popwell, RN, and myself, work closely, closely with primary care providers and therapists to provide care that optimize positive results. We offer care at our main hospital here in Brighton or at nine satellite sites throughout Massachusetts. Thanks to you, as well as to Melody and the Parkinson's Foundation for this opportunity to speak with you today. I know you will thoroughly enjoy today's presentation. Thank you for that information, Keith. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Okianis Bao. Dr. Bao is the director of the Movement Disorders and Deep Brain Stimulation Center at St. Elizabeth's. Her expertise is treating patients with Parkinson's disease, atypical Parkinson's, essential tremor, and other movement disorders. She is also a board certified sleep specialist and treats sleep disorders in patients with movement disorders. After receiving her medical degree from Semmelweis University of Medicine in Budapest, Hungary, Dr. Bao completed her neurology residency at New York Medical College and served as chief resident. She then pursued fellowships at Boston University School of Medicine in movement disorders and in sleep medicine. Following her fellowship training, she moved to Minneapolis at Naran Neurological Clinic, where she developed a robust movement disorders clinic and designed and directed one of the nation's largest and fastest growing DBS centers in private practice. Dr. Vau currently serves as the Neurology Clerkship Director for Tufts Medical Students and Site Clerkship Director for BU Medical Students and oversees the Tufts and Boston University School of Medicine Medical Student Education as well as the BUSM PA Student Program. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Vau. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Okani Spau, and I will be talking to you about vision and visual disturbances in patients with Parkinson's disease. Visual signs and symptoms can be an important aspect of the disease and should not be overlooked. Patients complain and have difficulty in reading. They have poor acuity, visual acuity, impaired color contrast, double vision, saccadic eye movement and abnormal blinking rate, and as well as abnormal pupillary reactivity. In terms of visual acuity, patients with Parkinson's often complain of poor vision, especially as the disease progresses, resulting in part for, from visual, poor visual acuity with low color contrast acuity. Decreased visual or poor visual acuity is a risk factor for the development of chronic hallucinations and Parkinson's disease. Dis decreased visual acuity may be caused by lack of dopamine in the retina, abnormal eye movements, or poor blinking. We know that visual acuity is marginally improved by drug therapy. Color vision is also affected in patients with Parkinson's disease, and vision is reported to be blurred for color stimuli. 
and a progressive deterioration of color discrimination is also present. And it's often associated with impairments of higher motor function. Color contrast sensitivity is affected in a portion of, of patients with Parkinson's. A substantial decrease in color sensitivity can be demonstrated as the disease progresses. And deficits in contrast sensitivity could be one of the explanation for the reports of poor vision made by patients with Parkinson's. It's most likely related to dopamine dysfunction, suggesting cortical involvement and processing. Levodopa generally improves contrast sensitivity and it may be close to that of normal, normal patients or patients without Parkinson's. Double vision, also called diplopia, is uh, along with difficulty reading are the most frequently reported visual symptoms. Difficulty reading can be due to several factors. One of them is double vision, diplopia. Slow eye movements and poor acuity and contrast sensitivity impairments also cause difficulties in reading. Diplopia gets worse as the disease gets worse, as Parkinson gets worse. Um, with diplopia is an ocular misalignment and decrease in ocular motility is what causes double images, double vision. Patients who feel sleepy, who have daytime sleepiness, see that, feel that they have more a higher risk of developing double vision. There was a study that looked at patients with Parkinson's and a control group and ocular health was similar. However, we did see that patients with Parkinson's had a higher frequency of to develop moderate to marked nuclear cater cataracts in um, the Parkinson's group. Eye movements are also affected in patients with Parkinson's disease as we know in Parkinson's disease, all movements are slow, and so are, so are the eye movements. We see abnormal saccadic and smooth pursuit eye movements that are reported in up to 75% of patients. This is probably a cause of akinesia or bradykinesia slow movements. Smooth pursuit movements, which are your eye movements when they're tracking an object, may be interrupted by jerky, jumpy movements called small saccades. And that may affect also your vision. We know that vertical eye movements are more impaired than horizontal eye movements. Talking about the blink, blink reflex, we all blink and um, not really think about blinking. However, in patients with Parkinson's, blinking or blinking rate has, is, is slower. There's a reduced frequency of blinking, which leads to this staring appearance. And when patients don't blink very frequently, that causes an abnormal tear film, um, dry eyes, and that also causes decreased vision. Um, blink duration seems to be increased in patients with Parkinson's, and that may be due to a loss of dopamine neurons as well. That also means that with dopaminergic medication, we do see as sometimes an increase in the blink rate. Pupils are also affected in patients with Parkinson's disease. We do see that patients have a significantly larger, larger pupil diameters after light adaptation, with no differences being observed after dark adaptation. How our pupils work when we go outside to very, on a sunny day, we will see that our pupil will become very small in order to protect our eyes from very, from very bright light. And in contrast, when we move into darker areas and low lit areas, our pupils enlarge so that they allow as much color, uh, sorry, as much light as possible to help us see better. That is affected in patients with Parkinson's. 
they have longer light reflex latencies and constriction times. In other words, their adapt adaptation from changes to light is slower. This is possibly due to autonomic imbalance in patients with Parkinson's, which involves the parasympathetic system. Moving on to distorted images called hallucinations. The, the definition of hallucinations is perceptions in a conscious and awake state in the absence of any external stimuli. Patients with Parkinson's also have delusions. Delusions are different. They're, they're false or erroneous beliefs not based on real data. And there's also illusions. Illusions are a little different than hallucinations, but they do coexist with patients with um, Parkinson's disease. It's a misinterpretation of a true sensation. With, along with hallucinations and illusions, we do see also feelings of pres presence and passage. The patients have a sensation that someone's next to them or a shadow is just passing by and they turn not to see anyone. That is usually the beginning, the onset of very mild hallucinations. They eventually turn into more complex visual hallucinations, which are very common in Parkinson's, up to 17% with patients, in patients with Parkinson's, and um, up to 89 in patients with Parkinson's dementia. Typically, they're visual. We do see some delusions, up to 14% in drug-treated Parkinson's disease. And some patients have insight and some think that the hallucinations are real. In patients who don't have dementia, everyone, all patients have insight. In other words, they know these images that they see are not real. And insight is retained in only 64% of patients who have dementia. There's also associated illusions in 13% of patients with dementia. However, in patients who don't have dementia, delusions are not present. Different types of hallucinations, we just mentioned the presence, the passage hallucinations where people are passing by, or people, patients see people passing by or shadows passing by, and then eventually there's the form hallucinations. One thing to know about hallucinations is that they're more frequent at night in low lit um, rooms and places, and eventually they become complex and stereotype images of animals, of people, objects, sometimes it can be lines or patterns. They may, may last seconds, minutes, even longer than that. And the characters seem to be scared. However, hallucinations scatter by light, if you turn on the lights, by noise, um, in crowded places, patients don't usually get hallucinations, or if they start waving their hand, they, these hallucinations might go away. Patients who have cognitive impairment and dementia have a higher risk of developing hallucinations. Duration of Parkinson's disease increases the risk for hallucinations, and patients who feel tired and sleepy may also have a higher risk of having hallucinations depression, visual disturbances, and dopaminergic medication increase the risk of hallucinations. In many cases, hallucinations are treatable and they're treated with antipsychotics such as clozapine and quetiapine without worsening Parkinson's symptoms. Quetiapine is the most frequently used medication to treat hallucinations, but and due to the sedative properties, we give this at night um, to help also with sleep. One of the relatively new medications that came out is the only FDA approved medication for hallucinations, and this is called primavancerin. It's also very, very useful to treat, and we use it very often to treat hallucinations. If hallucinations persist, we also consider the discontinuation of medications, Parkins, uh, Parkinsonian medications that cause hallucinations. We consider discontinuing 
selegiline, amantadine, anticholinergics, and dopaminergic agents and dopamine agonists. A few things to know about your medication and how these may affect um, your vision. Anticholinergic drugs, medications such as trihexyphenidyl, which is commonly used or is sometimes used in patients with Parkinson's to treat tremor, can cause blurred eyes, dry eyes, uh, sorry, blurred vision, dry eyes, and inacycoria. We know that dopamine agonists cause hallucinations. Levodopa may affect pupil size, double vision, and cause hallucinations as well. MAOB inhibitors may also cause loss of visual acuity and blurred vision. And also mantidine has a higher risk of causing hallucinations. So how do we want to optimize your vision if there's already some initial concerns? Always make sure that you wear a hat and sunglasses to protect your eyes from the sun. These days, we are spending a lot of time around screens, computers, iPads, iPhones, etc., And this causes eye strain, computer eye strain. So we want to reduce the computer eye strain. Make sure that every hour you look at least six feet away from the screen for at least 10 minutes. This should definitely help you with your vision. Make sure you wear eye protection when eyes could be damaged. And let's talk about diet. Make sure you eat some fish and introduce fish and seafood in your diet. Studies indicate that a fish meal just once a week reduces the chance of developing macular degeneration by 40%, possibly by combating the deposition of free radicals in the eye. Make sure you eat more salads, green, leafy vegetables, which studies show to help the retina of the eye in, in, in working in a better working order. And ensure that you have eye checks every year to screen for conditions such as glaucoma and to optimize your prescription. We will now continue with Dr. Holder who will be talking to you about disorders of smell and taste. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Vao, for sharing how Parkinson's disease can impact vision. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anna Holler, who will share more on the smell and taste aspects of these special senses. Dr. Holler joined St. Elizabeth's Medical Center from Boston Medical Center in November of 2017 as the first female chair of neurology. She is a professor of neurology at Tufts University School of Medicine. She also serves as Director of Medical Student Education for Steward Healthcare and is the Assistant Dean at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center's affiliate site for Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Holler completed her undergraduate and her medical degree at Boston University in the seven-year accelerated medical program. She then completed her internship and residency in neurology at MAMC in Tacoma, Washington. After eight years of distinguished military service in the U.S. Army, She was honorably discharged having achieved the rank of major. She then completed a fellowship in movement disorders at Boston Medical Center and served there for 11 years. Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Holler. Hello, I'm Dr. Anna Holler. I'm going to be talking now about disorders of taste and smell as relate to Parkinson's disease. The two senses are actually linked together in terms of the processing in the brain. So when there's a disruption in one portion of that system, it can affect the other as well. Here you see a very complex diagram showing some of the details of the anatomy of both the sense of smell with olfaction and the sense of taste, which we'll talk about in some more detail. Disorders of smell, there's a small area on the mucous membrane that lines the nose. The olfactory epithelium contains specialized nerve cells called smell receptors. The receptors have hair-like projections that detect the odors. The airborne particles entering the nasal passage then stimulate the cilia 
And this triggers a nerve impulse that goes to the nerve fibers, which then gets sent up to the back of the nose where the cribiform plate is, connects to the olfactory bulbs of um, outpouchings of the brain, and then help with transmission to the olfactory nerves. So that sounds very complicated, but the idea is that there are multiple steps and pathways where smell can be disrupted. Then once it's transmitted to the brain, the brain interprets the impulse as a distinct odor. The area of the brain where memories of odors are stored is also very important. And this helps with smell memory and our appreciation of tastes. What this also does is it sets up our sensor, sensory portions to anticipate certain things will smell and taste a certain way. So for example, the smell of a rose. In our mind, we have a registration of that from, from some point in our life. And when we smell things that our brain doesn't have the same receptor for, then it can feel like a disconnect. So for example, if you go to smell a rose and it smelled like something unpleasant, that would be jarring to the senses. The importance of smell memory is that it actually helps us to protect ourselves. And likely this was an ancestral component that actually helped us to avoid areas of danger when we remembered smells that were associated with difficulties in the past a lot of our senses are set up that way to help to protect us. What we see in Parkinson's patients is that there's a deficit of odor identification or discrimination in up to 85% of patients over the course of their Parkinson's disease. The very interesting thing is that oftentimes these disorders can develop early in the course of the disease. And so patients may start to lose their sense of smell even before they develop difficulties with motor function. And as a result, this can be potentially a biomarker for the development of Parkinson's disease patients in patients who are at risk. We also know that patients who have smell disorder, it can correlate with the progression of the disease. So people may have progression of their smell deficit over time. And because the sense of smell and taste are related, when people lose their sense of smell or have a decrease in it, it can affect their appetite as well and impact the pleasure of eating and the pleasure of sensory input. Patients who have changes in their sense of smell also have other aspects that may be more prominent with their Parkinson's disease. And we call these features non-motor features. So they may have more problems with depression and anxiety, more problems with constipation, and more problems with something called REM behavior disorder REM sleep is when we are dreaming. And for certain individuals with REM behavior disorder, they might act out their dreams. And so they might speak out during their dreams or actually act out certain portions of their dreams. You know, if they're boxing or if they're walking, they might even get out of bed. So what we see as a result is that there's actually a reduction in the size of the olfactory bulb in patients with Parkinson's disease. And we think that this is related to the fact that there are some significant associations with Parkinson's disease with environmental toxins. So that those might be infectious toxins like bacteria, viruses, the 1918 flu pandemic, for example and environmental toxins, such as things like exposure to paraquat and other types of chemical exposures that may result in Parkinson's disease. So we think that there's damage to the olfactory bulb, and this is part of what's happening in terms of their neurodegenerative process. Many people believe that there's actually some type of toxin entering the brain system through the olfactory bulb that's then transmitted to the motor portions of the brain and then to the brain as a whole. Taste, as I mentioned, is also very associated with the sense of smell. So the taste buds on the tongue comprise the majority of the surface of the tongue and different taste buds are associated with different types of taste. So you have five basic tastes and they are sweet, salty, sour, bittery, bitter, and savory. And combinations of these 
types of basic tastes give us the subtleties of our food that we eat and other things that we're drinking, for example. Sweetness is associated with the tip of the tongue, whereas saltiness is best appreciated on the front sides of the tongue. Sourness is along the further back sides of the tongue. And then oftentimes bitterness is detected in the back third of the tongue. So what happens when food enters the mouth is that it stimulates the taste buds, triggering a nerve impulse in the associated nerve fibers. And those are connected to the fibers associated with taste. The impulse then travels along the nerves to the brain and that the brain interprets the combination of impulses from these different taste receptors as a distinct taste. So sensory information about the food's smell and then the taste, the texture, the temperature is then processed in the brain to produce this distinct flavor that we sense when we are tasting something. And as we know, you can have very nice subtleties in terms of your sensation of taste. So for example, a creme brulee in one, from one chef or one amazing cook might taste different from one from another. And that is related to the subtleties of sweetness, saltiness, and texture. And so each individual has their own interpretation of what tastes good and what doesn't taste good. Some of this is developed through our exposures in our childhood. And some of it is impacted by changes in smell and taste that happen over time. So oftentimes, for example, children appreciate foods that are very sweet. Oftentimes as our taste buds, quote unquote, mature over time, we appreciate more subtleties in terms of savory and bitter. But what we see in many of our patients who have changes in their taste buds is that they then also gravitate again towards sweet and salty foods as they have some changes in their taste buds. And so they may start gravitating to foods that they enjoyed earlier in their youth, for example. So here's a diagram showing the different areas for the taste buds and their associated sensory input. So as I mentioned before, sweet at the front of the tongue, salt, sour, bitter, and umami is another type of savory component that's found in kind of a mushroomy smell. Oftentimes the best chefs actually utilize a combination of all of these different types of components in their meals to make them complex. And they're also therefore felt to be most enjoyable in terms of stimulating many different parts of the brain. So as I mentioned before, these signals get integrated in the brain. And in addition to the integration and the interpretation, it also impacts our emotional response to both smell and taste. So there's a lot of emotion that is linked to these two. And as I mentioned before, in terms of trying to keep us safe, smells keep us safe, um, taste changes can as well. So when we have been exposed to something early on that gave us a bad taste in our mouth, oftentimes we may avoid that taste for even the rest of our lives. So oftentimes if we're reintroducing a new taste later on, we might mix it with something that tastes good to kind of help our sensory system adjust. And we can develop um, appreciation for different types of tastes over time as well. After age 50, most people start to have a decrease in their ability to smell and taste. And this is because most people have a deterioration in the lining of their nose, it becomes thinner and drier, and the nerves involved in smell therefore deteriorate. Most older patients and individuals can detect strong odors, but detecting subtle odors may be more difficult. And so subtle odors might be things like perfumes or very subtle kind of scented candles, these types of things. But most older individuals will still be able to smell things like chemical smells. Those can sometimes trigger a different nerve process, the nerves um, in the trigeminal system, which can be activated by noxious stimuli. Their taste buds as we get older also decrease. And so, as I mentioned, people are more stimulated by sweetness and saltiness than like they had been in their youth. What happens when foods start to taste bland is that the enjoyment of eating becomes less and much of our society is actually based on enjoyment of food and food appreciation. 
and we have very significant rituals involved with meals. Take, for example, Thanksgiving. It's not just about the eating, but about the ceremony and about the being together with friends and family, and we have favorite foods and things like that. What happens when we lose that type of emotional response to our food or the food doesn't necessarily trigger these types of brain impacts is that we tend to eat less and tend to potentially even avoid certain types of foods. And so as a result, that can impact our weight. So what we need to do in that regard is to actually think about how much we're eating and ensure that the foods that we're eating have a significant amount of nutrition and caloric intake. And we might try and shift the palate of the types of food that we're eating in terms of a little bit more sweet and salty to make them more appealing as we age and also with Parkinson's. We also want to think about how do we optimize our smell and our taste sensation. So there are several ways to do this. For optimizing smell, number one is stopping smoking. If we are able to stop smoking, then typically we're able to help to reduce some of the difficulties that are happening in terms of changes in our mouth and in the structure of our nose as well, in terms of the smell and taste receptors. In addition, if we have difficulties with nasal congestion, that can also impact our sense of smell and taste. So we wanna make sure that we're treating nasal congestion with decongestants. We wanna try and avoid exposure to toxic fumes and pollutants, which we know can further cause degeneration in terms of our olfactory bulbs. We wanna also protect against injury to our nose. Injuries to the nose can shear some of these connections resulting in disruption of sensation. So we see frequently that people can have difficulties in terms of their sense of smell as a result of having changes in terms of head injury, for example. One of the things we can do as well is we can eat foods high in zinc, such as found in lamb, yogurt, and seafood. Those things can also help to stimulate our sensation of smell. We can also work on optimizing taste. So we can brush our teeth twice a day using rolling and stimulating mouth and gum sensation. We can make regular dental appointments and we can work on breathing through our nose because mouth breathing can also reduce the flow of saliva which protects the teeth from decay. I'm gonna pause here now and we'll get into questions. Great, thank you Dr. Holtler and Dr. Vow for sharing this fantastic information with us today and for your insightful presentations on these special senses. I want to note and thank our audience for the many, many, many excellent questions that we received um, in your pre-submitted registration forms. Because of the volume we received, I want to acknowledge that if we don't get around to answering your question, please do consider calling our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO to speak with a Parkinson's specialist. I now welcome back Dr. Holler and Dr. Bao for our Q&A segment. Now we're gonna move on to some questions that we had from the Parkinson community. Um, some of the questions that come up is, how are these Parkinson's related vision problems diagnosed? Typically, this is something you may wanna bring up to your neurologist and then that you are referred to the eye doctor, the ophthalmologist, or just mention it to your ophthalmologist when you're having your regular eye uh, visual checkup. Now, how can Parkinson's uh, related vision problems be treated? Well, it depends what it is. If you have trouble with double vision with diplopia, then a neuro ophthalmologist would be able to help you with um, prescribing prism glasses, for example. If it is hallucinations, then you might want to talk to your neurologist about this and making adjustments to medications as we previously mentioned. So it really depends on the type of the problem. If you have blurry vision or um, difficulty reading, you may want to visit and discuss this with your eye doctor. Another question that came up was how 
do Parkinson's disease vision difficulties affect driving? This is a very, very good question. They obviously with blurred vision or double vision is affecting driving and we do not recommend that you drive if this is what you have. Vision in general becomes more difficult in um, towards the evening when uh, there's not much light or in very cloudy and poor visibility conditions, we do not recommend that you drive if you have difficulties. Other types of problems that occur with patients with Parkinson's with visual disorders is or difficulties is um, spatial recognition. They sometimes have problems parking the car. So if you end up having difficulties estimating different distances, or if you have many dents in your cars by parking, that may also be addressed by a neurologist and your eye doctor, and maybe you should not drive or park. Another question that came up is, my husband with Parkinson's appears to have blind spots and difficulty with visual memory, getting lost at home. What causes this and what can be done? So this is something that typically, we typically see when patients start having dementia or cognitive, cognitive difficulties and not really processing their visual information and they don't have visual memory so as to remember and orient themselves in space. So what we typically want to do, you want to get a cognitive evaluation so that this is objectively measured and see whether this is mild dementia or moderate or severe dementia. And then there's different treatment options you may want to discuss with your neurologist if this is the case. And I think the rest of the questions are for Dr. Holler. Wonderful. So the next question comes to us. My appetite is poor because I can't taste or smell. Why is this happening? So as we discussed quite a bit in the presentation today, a lot of this related to Parkinson's has to do with some degeneration of the nerves and the connections that happen between the nose and between the taste buds and the brain. And this is happening as a result of this type of either environmental stress on the system, as we suspect that might be contributing to this. The next question is what smells are lost first in Parkinson's disease? So typically the more mild smells are lost first. So faint smells of different types of food, faint smells of things like a perfume that's maybe lighter. Those types of things are lost first and more stronger or more toxic smelling, noxious types of smells are lost later in the disease process. And this concludes our questions for today. We hope that we were able to help enlighten you about some of these topics, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great, thank you both. This Q&A segment does conclude our presentation. And on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, I wanna thank our fantastic speakers, Dr. Holler and Dr. Vow, as well as the Movement Disorder Center team at St. Elizabeth's for their collaboration to deliver this fantastic program to you today. Of course, a very special thank you to each of you for joining us. Again, if your question was not answered, please do call our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO. For more information about resources upcoming, our virtual events, visit our website at parkinson.org or for more local touch, visit parkinson.org slash New England. This program was recorded and will soon be archived on our YouTube channel, parkinson.org slash YouTube. For more information or to connect with the Movement Disorder Center at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, please visit semc.org slash neurology or call 617-789-2375. Another round of applause and thank you to today's sponsor, of course, our platinum sponsor, Synovian, and our bronze sponsors, Acadia, Kiowakirin, and Medtronic. You can learn more about today's sponsors by visiting our virtual exhibit hall at parkinson.org slash New England slash chapter supporters. And last but not least, we hope you'll come back soon. Our next virtual New England program is on December 8th for New Frontiers and Research and Care. 
with Dr. Albert Hung and Dr. Anne Marie Wills from MGH, a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. You can learn more and register at parkinson.org slash new frontiers MA. In recognition of Family Caregivers Month, next up in PD Health at Home on Wednesday, November 11th is Caregiving from Afar. For a complete lineup of our PD Health at Home programs, please visit parkinson.org slash PD Health. And that just about wraps us up, folks. So in the coming days, you'll be receiving a short survey. We hope you'll take a minute to complete it. We'd really love to get your feedback on this program and hear about other topics you'd be interested in learning more about. On behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation and St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, thank you again for joining us. Please continue to stay well and come back soon.